it was really interesting in the last session there was a conversation about Asian hyphen Australians and you can notice on our slide we have not included the hyphen and this has been a conversation of much ferocious debate in our office about is it a hyphenated word? Is it non-hyphenated? Aren't Asian Australians actually just Australians? Or do we need to have this different sort of name? How does this work? So we've gone with a non-hyphen on our slide today, but we can probably debate that. Um, but I take immense pleasure in introducing the next session. Um, as you can probably understand, we began as an artist association, so artists are the core of how we work. It's actually quite unusual that you get a contemporary art art organisation of our size that comes back to such a clear artist-led and remains an artist-focused um, organisation. The artists on the panel um, reflect quite diverse histories and I think this is really um, important that when we think about the term Asian Australian, it isn't something that is a singular definition. The word Asian Australian is associated um, with many different things. The people that um, identify as being Asian Australian identify with that term from a variety of different backgrounds, frameworks and futures about how they think Asian Australians have a role to play within our very multicultural and complex society. This panel is also supported and facilitated by the Asian Australian Studies Research Network, who today is actually celebrating their 10th anniversary. Yay! Um, I personally have had lots of friends and lots of associations with the group. It is probably one of the most active research networks of people that work across different um, strains of thinking, different practices, whether it's from health to politics to art. So it's been really quite an interesting debate that Jackie and the team at um, Asian and Australian Studies Research Network have facilitated over the last 10 years. So I'm excited about today. I think it's really going to um, look at and refresh in response to the first session about when we think about Asian Australian and Asian Australian artists, how is that playing out in 2016 and looking towards 2017 and beyond? So I'm going to introduce our great panellists today. So John Young. John is a very special friend of 4A. He was born in Hong Kong in 1956 and moved to Australia in 1967. He read philosophy of science and aesthetics here at the University of Sydney and then studied, studied painting and sculpture at Sydney College of the Arts. He has devoted a large part of his four-decade career towards regional development in Asia and has participated in many regional group travelling exhibitions in Asia, um, including AsiaLynx Art from Australia. He also, more importantly today, is the founding chair of 4A. He was the one that was part of that really instrumental first forum at Sydney College of the Arts in 1993 that sort of began the framework for Asian Australian artists to move towards the establishment of 4A. Um, but not only that, he remains on our board and he's a really important part of our board as an artist and someone you know, innately connected to that early period and showing that the artist remains part of what we think of when we think of what we should be um, going forward with our programs. So I found these two great photos of John from the early years. One is him opening, I think it's a fundraiser in 1997. And the second one was in 2008. Um, there was a conference, I think this is the one you referred to with Vernon before, um, where for a, well, you know, almost around the 10 year mark, looked at the idea of Asian Australian art now. So this is something we've come back to at a regular interval to re-question or refocus or rethink about what we mean by this term and how we should be approaching it. And I think realistically, as an organisation, discussion is as much for us and how we should be thinking, guided by the artists today as well. Um, second speaker is Mayu Kanamori. Mayu is a storyteller. She predominantly works with sites specifically with communities and collaborates with artists and creators from all genres. Born in Tokyo but based in Australia, her work sees her write plays, blogs and poetry, create installations, performances, document documentaries, radio programs and produce art projects and oral history programs and seminars. She also, I think, is really important in terms of a critical Asian Australian voice because if she's not producing work herself, which has been an extensive amount of work, she's been documenting the work of others. So many of our images like Darchi have come from the archives of Mayu. I've got an image of her here with John and Owen, all of you guys at the NYU Global Arts Exchange Workshop. So in terms of these voices, these are sort of major players that have come together to talk about these things many times over. Um, Owen Leong. Owen Leong is a Sydney-based contemporary artist exploring the transmission of culture and the body as a physical site of exchange. Photography, video, sculpture and installation are all vehicles for Leong's unsettling yet seductive story portraits that blur the boundaries between his real and performed selves. 
we had quite a lot of images with Owen, but we have chosen these ones. Um, <laughs> Owen had his first solo exhibition at Foray in 2003, but he also worked as the gallery assistant at Foray in 2005. And just last month, and the image here is um, on the right, is from when um, he was part of our delegation for the Australian Pavilion at the Longley New Media Festival. So here he is watching his really pristine photographs be drilled into an ancient temple. <laughs> One of our last speakers is Abdul Abdullah. He's an artist from Perth who's currently based in Sydney. He and I actually moved here pretty much the same time. Um, he works across painting, photography, video, installation and performance. As a self-described outsider amongst outsiders, his practice is primarily concerned with the experience of the other in society. Abdullah's projects have engaged with the different marginalised minority groups and he's particularly interested in the experience of young Muslims in the contemporary multicultural Australian context. Um, he's just become a family member of 4A and earlier this year he received some funding to go on a residency and he came in to chat and I'm like, you have to go to Jogjakarta. So we organised um, some hookups with him and some of the crew, which you can see here. Here he is with his brother and Echo Negroho in Echo Studio. And from that um, he developed a series of works, some of which are part of Jogja Calling, which we have on at the gallery now. Lastly, but not leastly, um, Professor Jacqueline Lowe, who was a member of the Australian Studies Research Network and personally has unwavering support of everything that Foray does. I think she's one of the first people to call me when I came up to Sydney, was probably in the doors pretty much a few weeks after that. Um, and she's really interested in how we talk about and think about and theorise what Asian Australian mean and what that means to sort of a contribution to not only Australia but to wider Asia and internationally. She is an Associate Dean International for the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences and Executive Director of the Australian National University Centre for European Studies. She's also the Chair of the Academic Board 2016 to 2018. Jackie is also the Adjunct Research Fellow of the Centre for Interweaving Performance Culture at the Free University of Berlin. Her research focuses on issues of race, colonialism, diaspora and the interaction of cultures and communities across ethnic, national and regional borders. So you have quite the expertise on the panel today. So, Jackie, I think I'll hand it to you. Fantastic. Oh, sorry, one little photo of her here with some of the other Asian Australian Research Network groups who regularly have conferences that kind of discuss me and continue these discussions in a more formal context. Thank you so much, Michaela. Hi, everyone, and welcome to session two. So, let me tell you a little bit first about the Asian Australian Studies Research Network and how we work with um, our friends in so many other institutions because as we're reflecting on 20 years of achievements this you know so much of what we do is we you know we stand on the shoulders of other giants before us and the question that I'll be posing to all of us is what are we going to do looking forward as well but uh, the AASRN was formed formally 10 years ago so we're celebrating our 10th birthday alongside Peril, our um, partner magazine, the um, Asian Australian magazine for arts and culture. Um, there's some flyers around doing a bit of a promo. We've got a birthday party coming up in Melbourne in two weeks and you're all invited. Um, but uh, this is a birthday celebration for the network, for Peril. Um, we're also looking at a number of other um, uh, uh, affiliated associations. And what really comes through in reflecting on two decades of uh, shared histories is just how much personal histories relationships are wrapped up across these. And I hear I'm, rem and I know I've got lots of friends and um, here who will remember um, the important role that Belvoir Theatre through Sharon Yin Lo did in fostering and supporting very early Asian Australian performance work. That Performance 4A has continued to build on um, with Annette and so many others are in, in the room here. Um, so the AASRN was formed 10 years ago formally, but we actually had our first meeting in 1999, around the same period that we started talking about the, the, a period of um, a response to One Nation and Hansenite politics of those, in, in those days, which was very much targeted at indigenous and Asian Australians against a very heated uh, migration debate. Um, when for many, many people of my generation of growing up in, in, in um, at the beginnings of multicultural Australia, we were starting to feel very comfortable. Someone may ask about the bicentennial. Well, the bicentennial didn't bring up any of those issues because issues of Asianization really were not there, much less uh, there was a, a, um, a, a 
bit more of a resistance from um, indigenous communities, but there was no Asianization of uh, 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 presence in, in, in that sense. Um, so for that period of gen people of my generation growing up in Australia, we were beginning to feel integrated. And around about the mid-90s, late 90s, was a period of heightened racism when suddenly we felt yellowed and browned all over again. And that really brought together the solidarity platform called Asian Australia hyphenated or not, or hyphenated and, <laughs> I should say. And we also had a slash sometimes as well to, to add to the mix. So it was a platform of political solidarity. It was an opportunity for artists, for academics, for community activists to come together, to work together in solidarity, um, often with indigenous communities as well. We had ANTA, we had quite a number of other groups that we were working with, um, very much as a platform for resist, uh, resistance against um, an overwhelming um, um, culture of um, heightened racism is the only word I could put um, at that period. And since then, it's remained that, not in, in, in essentializing identity in any way, but very much a, a network that looks at bu capacity building, uh, building an intelligence around problematizing, critiquing, and challenging notions of what national identity means, what diasporic identity means, um, what our politics mean, and trying very hard not to homogenize um, but to, in fact, um, make the, appreciate things in its complexity. And that's really the, uh, at this point, I want to um, um, invite our speakers to talk to how art can um, introduce, how art can, in fact, give space to those difficult conversations that we want to have, that we began earlier this morning, um, to ask our, um, um, each of you in, as artists, um, how you interact with Foray, but also with all the other institutions that, we've ha or that, that are in the room that collectively enable these conversations to be sustained over the last 20 years and we hope into the future 20 years as well. So firstly, how do each of you, um, what's your involvement with Foray or with um, um, Performance 4A, who, which has now been renamed uh, the Contemporary Asian Australian Art Association, Performance Association, um, and also the AASRN. So a little bit about you know, your involvement with these uh, organizations and what it means uh, in terms of your practice and, and perhaps your politics as an Asian Australian artist. So over to you first, John. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. That was a nice way to frame this context. Uh, I guess I, I'll just go back to to some of the fundamentals of, of what it means to be an Asian Australian artist, perhaps. Uh, and I thought a lot about it, actually, and I only came up with this sort of like today. And, uh, and I thought that maybe there are maybe at least three aspects of being an Asian Australian artist, the meaning of it uh, lies, which is that maybe the first is to have the freedom uh, in describing or reimagining with merit uh, the values of my heritage or values from Greater Asia. That's the first thing. And the second thing is to then confront with this sort of describing, to confront and make better the, the dominant worldview. And then the third thing is to hope for an adequate acknowledgement of this change. So, so for me, uh, as an artist, these are maybe some of the fundamental things that I've faced over the 20 years with 4A that, um, that has changed, has you know, really evolved. Uh, and it's not because, just because of the relationship between Australia and, and uh, Asian migration. It's also changed because uh, of the change in technology and the change in the media especially uh, within the art world as well. The whole, there's a huge paradigmatic change in the art world ever since Foray started in 1996. So, um, so um, I mean, it's very interesting that, that, that uh, Lindy talked about the fact that, you know, how she, she started. And I, and I can really, really uh, identify with that because I think that um, the phases that went prior to 4A's opening 
uh, certainly in the 80s was postmodernism, and by the 90s it was sort of postcolonialism. And the thing is that uh, in the 80s, uh, there were only a few Chinese or uh, Asian artists, uh, but we, and as Lindy said, we really had to uh, put a white face on, basically. Uh, I contributed uh, in a in a magazine called Art and Text and wrote about uh, Baudrillard in 1981 and, and nothing to do with Asia. Um, and then um, by the time when postmodernism developed over the 80s, uh, there was a turning. There was a turning because of, you know, uh, the politics. And uh, at that stage, I really felt that there was a moment when I can really start looking at uh, being an Asian Australian artist. And at that point, uh, there were quite a few clenchpin events, actually. Uh, one was uh, within the art world. The first thing was in 1990, Asia Link started. And in 1991, uh, John Clark uh, did the great conference, which is Modernism and Postmodernism in Asia, which demonstrated to everybody who was completely, well, I was totally ignorant of, which was that there were modernities in Asia right from the start. So that, in a sense, technically should have shifted the entire discourse. Um, and then after that, of course, uh, you know, we organized other smaller events like uh, uh, the symposia that, that uh, on uh, Asian Australian artists, looking just within sort of Asia uh, and Australia. And, um, and of course, the, the first Chinese exhibition, Mao Goes Pop, was, was, uh, came to Australia in 1993. So, so basically, all these events actually uh, really gave us a huge sense of um, momentum to, to, to think that, okay, well, maybe there is a possibility that there could be a voice for forays for people, Asian Australian artists. Uh, as a result, in 1995, you know, we got together, a few of us sitting around a room and, and started this. Um, and um, however, a bit from saying that, I, I really felt that the people that I was negotiating with in postmodernity in the 80s, as soon as I started looking at Asia, contemporary art and, and Asian Australian artists, I lost so many friends. I lost about half my friends, literally, you know, because they were not willing to deal with the situation about uh, Asia and Australia. And, and I must say that uh, it's very strange how the, the whole thing sort of filters down from the north uh, because Brisbane actually had the APT. Uh, people are much more uh, naturally well-versed to the fact of accepting uh, art from Asia. Uh, and, then, and then Sydney came along with, you know, uh, other events, and then finally now you know we, you've even got museums here like White Rabbits that that show uh, Asian art. Whereas Melbourne is still in quagmires of you know <laughs> not having anything to do with uh, really so much to do with uh, contemporary Asian art, let alone they just did an Ai Weiwei show. But you know, uh, so so basically um, the situation has really evolved, and I and I think that. Uh, uh, the the only way to, to, to really address the situation now, I think we can talk about that later on. I, I think that, um, you know, maybe I should pass that on to May, you too. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Mayu, and I feel like I'm part of the family. I see all these people here that have changed the course of my life. <laughs> Um, so I didn't know I was an Asian-Australian artist until I met Jackie Lowe. <laughs> in um, 2001 in Canberra uh, when I showed the uh, earlier version of a work called The Heart of the Journey which was a uh, later became a performance work to do with a um, indigenous woman Lucy Dan from Broome in Western Australia who I met um, she found out in her adult life that her father was uh, Japanese, who worked in broom in the pearling industry. I migrated from Japan in 1981, so we went to Japan together, and we did some search on her other side of her roots and found her father. 
So that was the beginning of my work to do with Asian Australia, I suppose. And then Jackie later on went to find, uh, founded the AASRN, the Asian Australian Studies Research Network. And from there, it, it, AASRN has actually philosophically as well as structurally and in all sorts of ways influenced my work. Um, the, the people who are executive members, but also the kind of people that AASRN attracted, like Annette Chumois, who's sitting in the front seat. Um, Annette is um, executive producer of uh, what used to be the Performance 4A. Now it is called the Contemporary Asian Australian Performance, or CAP. Um, Annette produced my last work, which was called Yaskichi Murakami Through a Distant Lens, which is a play I wrote about a Japanese photographer, um, two Japanese photographers, one a contemporary Japanese photographer uh, in search for the missing or the lost photographs of a historical Japanese Australian photographer, Murakami, who used to live in the Australian North. And uh, he had a thriving, he's a real person, he had a thriving business in, a photography business in Australian, uh, in Broome and in Darwin until the beginning of World War II. Like all Japanese in Australia on the day after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, Murakami was arrested and uh, interned, and he died whilst he was interned. So as a result, um, his photographs went missing. And for me, that was like a metaphor um, of the national collective amnesia in this country about the history of the Japanese, that many people think that the relationship between Japan and Australia began with the bombing of Darwin. As a matter of fact, the Japanese were here much earlier, and those lost uh, photographs was like a metaphor. Anyway, it's a metaphor, and I think this way now because I've been talking to people like Jackie all the way through for many, many years, and many of my works have been um, influenced by and written by um, researchers, and so that's my connection. Um, so my parents migrated to Australia in the 50s and 60s um, when there was still actually a white Australia policy which only legally ended in 73. Um, I was born in Sydney and um, when I was growing up as a teenager um, it was really during the height and the rise, the first rise actually of Pauline Hanson and her right-wing conservative political party um, in 96. Um, so really when I was growing up, I was surrounded by this um, politics of hate and fear in the media that was directed at that time towards Asian immigrants. I think she famously said that Australia is being swamped by Asians. So for me, these were really powerful and formative experiences in my life um, and my childhood because I had a deeply embedded sense of my alien body um, and an overpowering knowledge um, of my difference and my unbelonging. So when I started making art, I naturally gravitated towards an interrogation of whiteness, um, of identity, culture, and the politics of difference. So at the same time as the rise of Pauline Hansen in, the, in 96, in the mid-90s, um, I became aware of other Asian Australians who were rallying against her hate speech. Um, people like the Asian Australian Artists Association, which we now know as 4A. Um, people like the, a little bit later, people like the Asian Australian Studies Research Network. Um, and I've been really involved with both of those organisations quite heavily over the past few years, and it's been really formative in um, not only my life personally, but as, as an artist as well, in developing my language. Um, I felt that the work of these organisations and many others had a really important role to play because they formed a counter-narrative to the hate speech of One Nation. Um, and it felt to me, like, as a young Asian-Australian artist, that for me, Foray presented a really unique space in which I could locate my own voice um, amongst the multitude. And I could talk about diversity, multiplicity, identity, and belonging. 
Um, so I held my first solo exhibition at Foray in what was then the project space. Um, and it was really special to me. Um, I exhibited photographs and a sculptural installation that explored my queer identity and my sexuality. Um, and what's key about that is that I could position my Asian Australian body at the centre of my work. Um, I could recenter the Asian Australian body, I could refocus the photographic image on the Asian Australian body. And that little kernel of um, an idea has carried its way all the way through more than 10 years of practice now, where I've incorporated um, other Asian Australian people um, in series of sequences of work, um, and also returned again to my own body, but uh, against a changing landscape of social and cultural political ideas. Um, so I really felt empowered to know that places like 4A held space for voices like mine. Um, and I wanted to be part of that growing conversation amongst all of its complexities. Um, that experience gave me a greater sense of self within the Australian social, cultural and political landscape. And I felt what I took away from that initial experience of, um, um, of 4A and, and, and AASRN was that artists can be agents of change. Um, through the language that we speak, which is our language of art, that we can initiate dialogue, conversation, and, and shift um, focus of ideas in, in public space. Um, yeah, I think I'll just, I think I might hand over to you. What I, what I might say is that um, it's funny now that Pauline Hansen has risen again, you know, in the last election, but that now her shift, uh, her focus has shifted to Muslims and, um, and, and those immigrants and refugees. Um, I think the hate speech is the same, but she's just found a different target. And I think these kinds of forums are really important so that we can continue to challenge those ideas of hate and that we can continue to um, raise um, you know, ideas of identity as being complex and not so simply defined. Um, and not to let that overpower the conversation that we want to have. So. Thanks, huh? Uh, G'day, my name's Abdul. Um, it's funny, I don't think I've ever considered myself an Asian-Australian artist until maybe just now. <laughs> like, uh, I, I was born in Perth in 1986. My f mother is from Malaysia, uh, originally from Indonesia, like way back, and um, my father is a white Australian who converted to Islam in 1971, so he essentially, I guess, assimilated into what was then an entirely foreign culture. Um, and being born in 1986, I think I'm part of an older cusp of a generation of young Muslims worldwide that have grown up sort of post 9-11. Like that's our formative experience and, and sort of the blowback from there is who forms our political identities. And I see my religious identity almost primarily as a political identity. Uh, it was two years, like I, never, I didn't think I was ever going to be an artist growing up. It was two years into a journalism degree that I decided that art better suited my particular personality quirks and sensibilities. <laughs> um, it gave, it, I, I feel that as an artist I have a similar role to a journalist without the, um, like the objective burden, like I can just be <laughs> as, as subjective as, as I like. Um, but I, I wanted to be John Pilger growing up and now I wanted to be, now I wanted to be something else. Um, and when we're talking about the alien body and the otherness, like it, I'm, I'm going to sort of badly paraphrase Walid Ali here. But something that I'm really coming to terms with now is that uh, when we talk about the racism and bigotry of like groups like well, like One Nation and people like Pauline Hanson, uh, like it, who we are and what we identify as, this is me just riffing, seems to be entirely irrelevant to the enterprise. Like the, 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 it's their sort of, it's what they're projecting on us. So my early practice when it got quite political at first was trying to present uh, like the the nicest side of things or an alternative view but now I've sort of lent more towards holding a mirror up to those negative perceptions and, I'm, and, I, and that's the way that I'm doing it. We all go about things differently. In, in regards to um, my uh, connection with 4A, it's a very recent one. Uh, working with Makala has been fantastic in heading over to Jog Jakarta and I, like my personal interest goes into sort of uh, the, the effects of colonisation and that, that the sort of European colonial enterprise and what that, how that has sort of messed up the world and where we are now and these lines that have been drawn in the sand and sort of these nations that were built and all these sorts of things. And I, I think the Asian experience is a colonised experience and I think that can be related to the Australian experience. And um, going back to 
going to Jogjakarta and seeing their colonial history and their sort of Dutch history and uh, looking at my personal sort of ancestors in, in Sulawesi who sort of uh, who went to Malaysia and they fought alongside and against like the Portuguese, the British and the Dutch and other people. But then I'm, I'm kind of ranting, I'm going in circles, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, um, uh, oh, I've lost my point. Um, it's been great working with Fort A. Eh? <laughs> 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 I, I, I really enjoy uh, the, making those making those connections with like that that Asian experience and and the and the recent history and the, the longer history of art in our sort of sphere or in our hemisphere and uh, looking like having a less Eurocentric view and which has been something important for me in my own sort of development like looking at these at how these different practices and different like the way that people have approached like creative practices and, and political engagement in other parts of the world outside of the United States and, the, and Europe. I think that's... Great, thank you. So um, I guess one of the things that I want... You know, I, I began um, the, the, the session um, proposing that art gives us a space that allows difficult, complex issues to be raised, not necessarily answered, but to be raised at a time when there's very little space in the public domain for complex, big picture thinking, strategic, critical thinking to be sustained and dialogue, um, reciprocal dialogue, where people listen as much as talk to each other is sustained. And I wonder if art is one of those spaces that we do have left where we can have this kind of deep thinking and presentation of some of, of issues in its complexity. So that would be one proposition. The question to each of you would be that in your particular practice, what would be the one issue that you might want to raise as taking, uh, in your practice, taking um, 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 uh, occupation in this space that you would like to introduce and, and, and how would you introduce it? You might be in the work that you've already done or work that you are looking forward to doing? Thanks, Jackie. Um, great questions. Um, uh, first question of uh, the big picture thinking is a very, very important issue, uh, only because we do live in a plural society, not just a social area. And, uh, and my feeling about that is that uh, we can't do that just by art objects alone. It has to be together with art criticism and writing and uh, other forms of reflection around the object, uh, the framing of it as well. So, uh, and the worst situation in Australia in contemporary art is that there has been a decoupling in the last 10 years between the institutions. So the critics don't talk to the curators, the curators don't talk to the artists, the artists don't talk to the collectors, and the collectors don't talk to the galleries, gallery owners. Um, you know, it's not a unified uh, idea, whether you like it or not, the different values that was in the art world doesn't exist anymore. So how do we address this situation and even bring it to a big picture questioning? Is, is my, and my feeling is that uh, perhaps within, at least within the Asian Australian context, there is now room for art criticism, that, that there is a possibility of people writing more about the work, because the work at the moment is very presentationally focused uh, overall, and presentational work really delimits the amount of imagination as opposed to uh, representational work. If you do works that are representational, it leaves a space between uh, the work and the way how we question the work. And, and that space is where all the big picture things happened. Uh, so my feeling is that that, that is the case. Um, the second uh, thing to, uh, second question is that I don't actually think I have an identity anymore. Uh, the way how I've been tackling it is that I really initially looked at uh, issues about the ethical decisions that people make when they're crossing cultures, um, like migrants coming to a new land or whatever, the ethical decisions in, in different traumatic events. Uh, that would be one way of, of tackling my work, but the other is to, instead of looking at the 
horizontal side of the flatness of, of our art world, I'm looking in the vertical axis, which is the history. So I'm actually looking at the history of the Chinese diaspora. We've collected over uh, five years something like 130 stories of the history of Chinese in Australia. And, you know, uh, I'm involved in slowly making a, a visible proposition for all that together with other young artists as well. So, yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm, there's two parts. Uh, the issue that you were discussing about uh, art being the space where these complex issues could be discussed or brought into. So I've got two, one that I've been working up until now, and I have, the second one is one I'm going to, well, what I'm working on now. So it's my up to my last work, and my current work that I'm working on, it's made a bit of a change. So the first one, um, I guess being a Japanese Australian, the big thing has been the war. <laughs> you know, the Asian Australian experience, the whole study, the whole idea, the, the whole movement is based on colonialist history, Asia being colonialized, post-colonialism, white people colonizing, yellow people, that sort of thing. But as you know, Japanese were co colonizers in the last war, the world war, so I don't fit into that. Um, it's a difficult position. So that's been an issue, and I wanted to bring that up in discussion. But I'm moving into some a different area now where, as John was talking about, um, not having an identity as such. I'm becoming more, the more I become aware of my Asian Australianness or the Japanese Australianness, the more I want to challenge the preconceived notions that comes with that. So, like I write a play, let's say, and my name's on it as I'm the writer. People are going to come with a certain preconceived idea because I am who I am with an ethnic name. And by the time it's had its, had its preview writings, it's had, you know, it's been billed as a Japanese Australian, whatever. And I'm, that's an issue that I'm bringing forward. I mean, in, in the area of performance, I'm, Annette could, Shinwa could tell you a lot more about, there, there is the whole idea of um, diversity, like the, the Australian uh, theater lacking in diversity. There are not enough uh, Asian Australian writers, there are not enough Asian Australians actors on screen or theatre, Asian Australian stories. So th there's that whole area, but it comes with preconceived notions, and I'm kind of working on that. Um, for me, the, the big space idea is the lack of representation in, um, in popular culture and media. So the generalised whitewashing of, um, uh, you know, we all know about the, the, the films um, Hawaii Five-O, The Ghost in the Shell, where, you know, um, Asian characters have been cast in uh, with um, white American actresses. That's just one example. But um, for me growing up, and I think it has shifted slightly over the last 10 years, there was always a lack of representation. So for me, the most important thing was, I guess I was looking for my body. Where is my body in this um, cultural landscape? And so if you can't, um, I think there are strict guidelines and, and, and it's really rigid in, in popular culture as to what people are willing to consume or readily consume and what they want to see. So I think in art, there is slightly more latitude in what you can do, whether you're an artist or um, an organization, to open up that conversation. For me personally, as an artist, it, it was, was always about using my own body, which um, I was looking for, and opening up these fictional spaces to really bring attention to the, the energy um, um, of whiteness, the hegemonic power of whiteness, in the way that it um, has an invisible power over our culture, our bodies, the way that our bodies are read. Um, perceived, desired, consumed. And so I started out with my body in my work and I used prosthetics such as prosthetic um, contact lenses to accentuate my alienness. I used prosthetic wounds to um, draw attention to the surface of the body, to the skin um, as a surface, as a membrane that could be penetrated or punctured and what would come out. And often in my works, whiteness would come out. 
So white liquids would come out of the wounds of my body, or I would be ingesting milk. So things like milk and honey, things that we um, experience on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as a metaphor for social, cultural, and political forces that pass across our bodies that you might not be aware of but have a tangible effect. If you ingest them, um, their effect on you from the inside. Um, so as an example, one of the videos that we showed at Long Lee um, was a video work called Infinite Love. Um, where my mouth is held open by um, a surgical medical device. So my mouth is forced open. I've sculpted a, a frozen heart made out of frozen milk. And as the, the heart melts, it drips whiteness into my mouth, which I can't close. Um, and as the video progresses, there is a, a gradual progression to discomfort. Um, and then it borders on a kind of violence that's enacted on the body by this white liquid that changes from a frozen to a liquid to another state. So it's about energy states and things like that. So I think I would like to address representation. Um, it's, I wanted to add, like, like respond to something in that, in that like, um, when we were talking about multiculturalism, I was on a panel with an Aboriginal activist in Melbourne called Gregory Starr, who works in Aboriginal health, and he, we were talking about multiculturalism, and he said, in Australia, we don't have multiculturalism. There's no multiculturalism here. There's, mul there's multiracialism, but there's a monoculture, and like his multiculturalism sort of suggests that there's, that there's equity between cultures, but he, he really saw it as just the one culture, and we're all sort of struggling against that, and I think that what yeah that's sort of like contributing to to what you're saying um in in regards to uh i keep forgetting where i am but yeah. <laughs> so, um uh, when i was uh, one of the reasons i stopped being a journal uh, stopped studying journalism and, and moved into art because i felt that art was a more suitable forum for me to say what i wanted to say is that i found as as a young person uh, like in my early 20s uh, no one really cared like if i if i like railed on about something in an article or at the time I was producing very bad hip hop when I did that, like it was either speaking to converted or people just weren't paying attention to it. But if I produced a photograph or a painting or a project like that, it like to me at the time it seemed magically that people would give it the time of day and they'd sit there with it and they'd appreciate it with it. And they, maybe it was because I wasn't so uh, forward in my own work, although often I was like uh, like we, we have similar practices in that. You know, often we we are our own. We are our own subjects in our own photography, um, but people wouldn't necessarily make that connection, but they'd give it a whole lot more time. Um, in regards to applying that to sort of shifting conversations and narratives, uh, the, the two things I wanted to mention briefly is that I'm firstly, maybe it's a journalism, maybe it's my personality, but I'm a real big cynic, and I, 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 part of me thinks that it's too late for an older generation or like even the current generation, and I try to do a lot of work in schools uh, and speaking with young people, whether they're in um, uh, whether they're in good schools, but primarily I'm looking at kids in outreach programs, like I've worked in juvenile justice and that sort of stuff, and to sort of bring those conversations to that next generation and hopefully arm them with some of the tools, or at the very least introduce them to someone who's had an alternative experience, who at home, by their parents, they might consider me like a like a threat somehow. So I, that, that's one way of doing things. And, and I guess the other thing that I try to do with my practice is to, is to really give the audience multiple access points. And by that I mean, uh, like, I, I don't shy away from things like beauty where I really want, like, the, like at it superficially, I, I want it, the work to be appreciated in that people can go, oh, that's a, a well-made painting or that's like a well-put-together photograph or something like that. But beyond that, the more time you spend with a work, I hope to sort of offer clues to a bigger story, and the more works you see, and the longer you spend with it, the the, the more um, the more you're exposed to sort of my hidden agenda. That sounds a little bit, a little bit shifty, but maybe I am <laughs> trying to embed my ideas in them. One of the really interesting things of having um, all four of you here is that we know we've got such different uh, diversity of experiences, of practices, um, also of generations in terms of, ex uh, you know, what were the kind of major turning points um, um, historically, socially, for, for that inform your practice. Um, I wonder, though, for, for, for each of you, and, you know, don't feel you've got to go in on right here, you know, you can mix it up, but what... Who do you think you who who is your audience? Who do you produce art for? I'll jump in. Great. 
I'm not really prepared for the answer, but the, uh, the, I've been asked this question a few times recently in the last year or so, and it's a, it should be a really easy answer, but it's really hard. Like when I'm producing work, I'm not thinking of necessarily the same audience that goes to the galleries that I show in, but I'm thinking specifically of the nine-year-old version of me who's sort of looking for themselves or looking for themselves reflected in the way that you were talking about in popular media. Like when I was talking about that monoculture before, like, uh, like, like you were saying, it's the Australian culture is reflected on like morning television and neighbours and current affairs and, and like these sorts of, that, like that's Australia, like that's how Australia is representing itself and we're not represented in that conversation. So like offering that to that sort of generation, mind you, I'm fully aware that I live in a bubble and the, the spaces that I exist in generally, apart from when I work in schools and that sort of thing, it's for like a very left leaning very open, progressive audience, and a sort of, but yeah, we 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 play to a whole lot of different things. So I don't know if there's an audience that I'm specifically looking for, apart from everyone. <laughs> but um, yeah, thinking about that, the kid. Well, that sounds funny, but you're thinking about the younger version of me. Great. Um, yeah, just riffing off um, that kind of sense of um, lack of representation. I I don't know if I have a specific audience in mind, but for me, it's about creating possibilities um, in, through my practice for myself, for my sense of self. And so if someone encounters that work and, um, and it jolts something in them to sort of, even if it's like a crack, um, or like a lot of my work is about breaking um, up body language or behavioral codes. So there might be repetitious behavior or it might be something slightly off about um, or, or unsettling about a body that might be constricted or pierced or something like that. And so it's just about a, a slight like, glitch in um, a regular person's day if they experience that work that might um, cause them to take away a, a, a slightly um, different perspective of what it might be to be Asian Australian. I guess I don't really have a specific audience mm -hmm. as such. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> well, I, it was a frightening question because I actually, to be really, really honest, I think I'm making work for wider Australia as opposed to international audiences. It seems like every work I've made, I've been t trying to talk to wider Australia as opposed to the wider world. So it was frightening that I kind of realize that. So, yes, but I do during the stages of when I'm making it and I'm talking to people, I do have a sense of responsibility to the communities that I belong to, whether it's the Asian Australian community, I feel, I, I feel responsible to be a voice, um, or the Japanese Australian community that I, 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 I represent them in a sense of having a Japanese voice in the wider community or I'm also a photographer by trade, and like the last work was about photography. So I felt, I felt that I had a sense of responsibility to the photographic community. So that sense of responsibility does translate to making work. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I, I think that, you know, for me too, it's, it, it, uh, it, my audience changes from project to project. I really believe that, uh, uh, for example, there are some projects um, within the sort of uber art area you cannot possibly talk about identity because as soon as you talk about identity, it closes you off as just an identity artist and they just don't think you're serious anymore, you know, answering, questioning the sort of like big questions about art. So, so for that sort of context, there's no point in, in doing that, for example. So it's, so it's very rhetorical in a, in a way in which we address these things, and, and, and but of course, uh, you know, we have a responsibility not just to the social now. We've got a responsibility to to the vertical axis in time as well. So I think that you know you have to have sort of a uh, an imaginary audience that is not exactly going to get your intentions in the future, but at least they could uh, you could provide parameters for them to 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 think about uh, the work in the future. Great. So what I'm hearing from, from, from all four of you is this um, negotiation between the, the kinds of um, politics of recognition that drives a lot of the work, and especially for both of you, I, I, I can hear that very clearly, um, recognition and insistence on, you know, we're here um, um, and we're naming and claiming. 
um, but I'm also hearing from, from, from Mayu and from John, um, alongside that also a sensitivity to the um, issues around uh, responsibility and reciprocity as well. And um, it's a really interesting tension that, I mean, obviously it's not an, a, a, an exclusive one. I wonder though how that kind of tension operates within Australia when you're engaging with your, your, your um, um, community as opposed to when you're showing or presenting your work internationally. And you've all had um, different kinds of international exposure, regional exposure. So does that change? And does your sense of being Asian Australian as opposed to being Asian, if you're in Asia, say, as opposed to because I know Owen and, 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 and Abdul have been in China and Indonesia very recently, and Mayu obviously floats between, and you in Hong Kong. So, you know, are you then Japanese, Chinese, Hong Kong, um, uh, when you're in those places showing and, and creating art? Or are you Australian if you're at the Berlin, in Berlin, John? Um, or, you know, um, I'm showing in New York, Owen. So, what, you know, does that change as well? So I guess it's a two-pronged question. Feel free to, to answer both or, or one yeah, or the other. Yeah, I, I think it absolutely changes. I think it absolutely changes. You know, in Berlin, they say, oh, you know, you're Chinese, you know. Do you, do you come from, uh, you know, Beijing? And I said, no, no, you know, south of Beijing, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, they have no concept of, of Asian Australian. You know, and if they do, uh, there's a sort of, a, in a way, there's a sort of a, a condescending attitude that, you know, like you're sort of this minor artist from this minor country doing this minor work, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, it, it, you know, in the past, I used to think that it's probably a good thing to be totally flexible when and feign that I'm actually a Chinese artist then, or an Asian Australian now, or whatever. But that is in a way why I have also decided not to define myself, that I've really concentrated on work that, that are transcultural, and it's really about the ethical decisions that people make in the cross cultures. You know, it's a bit more applicable in a more general sense. <laughs> <laughs> there is a difference. There, there is a difference. I, 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 I think I, 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 my work is Australian, actually. Um, that's what I think. Because, and like the, the last work, the Yasukichi Murakami Through a Distant Lens, we're trying to show it in Japan, and I have to re-change my thinking. It's already made, but we've, we've got to now think of it completely differently because I've been trying to talk... I've made the work as an Australian for an Australian audience, and this, and people, you know, people say, well, it's a natural sh show to be t shown in Japan, but the thinking has to change because it's... Or it doesn't work. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it is different. Yeah. And it's different in all sorts of ways. Um, I think it's really interesting that before um, Michaela was talking about, and we were all talking about the, the hyphen or, or the missing hyphen, um, and I think it's been a really interesting conversation that, that's happened over many years, actually, in Asian American studies and also Asian Australian studies, because different people think um, many different things. And I think it symbolizes for me the fluidity of... Um, our identities, because sometimes um, if I want to foreground something particular in my work, I will say that I'm an Asian Australian artist. Sometimes when I travel overseas, I'm an, a, just an Australian artist. But often when I've traveled to China, um, there's this sort of uh, disjuncture between what they perceive me as and um, what I'm saying that I am. So that, again, there's this sort of complexity in the way that you present yourself and what they, what they say, but you're Chinese. And I'm like, well, Actually, that's true, I am Chinese because of my heritage. And then we get into really interesting conversations about, um, yeah, about what that means in Australia and the race politics here and how it might be different over there. Um, and also what I found really interesting on our last trip with Pedro to Longli was that because it's in the this, this southern, in, the, um, in Guangzhou, in the Guangdong province, um, when we stepped off the plane, 
I was surprised because people started speaking, I was expecting Mandarin because for me, when I went to Beijing, it's all Mandarin, Shanghai, it's Mandarin and Shanghainese. So for me, in my cultural imaginary, my limited cultural imaginary of China, it's, it's Mandarin. We stepped off the plane and someone spoke Cantonese and I instantly felt like I was at home because my, my parents speak Cantonese. So there was this um, dysmorphia with my sense of self as I, as I arrived in that trip. So it's very fluid and it's very contingent on context and situation. Yeah, I think it's yeah, on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, um, to, to uh, quote a friend of mine who I collaborated with on, in 2012, he's also half Malay, half white Australian, half, so he's half Malay Chinese, half white Australian, and he said when he's in Australia, he's Asian, and when he's in Malaysia, he's a white guy. And so, like, and having that sort of experience, but not really feeling, having feet in both, both camps sort of things, but not feeling at home in either one. Um, and I, I've always described myself as ethnically ambiguous. Like, it's, it's, it's hard if people, if people guess where I'm from, not many people can sort of pick. Um, but I've found showing internationally, like, a Malaysia and Indonesia aside, but say when I've gone to uh, show, whether it's in the UK or in the United States, it's the, it's, my Australianness is secondary. The main thing people identify me as is Muslim artist. And where that's from, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, uh, but when I'm in Malaysia or Indonesia, where like the Muslim experience is a pretty broad experience, it's not, not like, I mean, Indonesia is almost universal, but not in Malaysia, but it's generally an experience. Um, there, it's, it's a different conversation about where I'm coming from and maybe I need to show like a video from Cronulla or some Reclaim Australia things and people will get on board but like at first there's a little bit of confusion on why I'm making the work that I'm making. Great. So what's really interesting is that, you know, well, when you first started the conversation, the, 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 the logic behind it or the, the kinds of um, uh, 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 implicit suggestions was that the art was as minority... Um, or visible, visible minorities creating art for a predominantly white Australia. But as the conversation has gone on, what I'm getting a strong sense of here is really that while that may be one position, the, there are other positions and other um, uh, 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 flows that you're also part of, which are regional, which are multiple, that move between, and that what began as the, the, this, this politics of recognition that I'm calling it is in fact only one part of what's driving the work that you do. So in some cases it's an interest in um, uh, a humanitarian ethics, uh, the sort of thing that John and, and Mayu's work around reconciliation of different kinds of difficult histories. In your case, um, Owen, I'm, he um, um, I'm hearing a, a, a whole lot more in terms of the positioning of the diasporic histories, um, and with yours, Abdul, um, you know, being part of a global uh, Muslim um, art movement or, or cultural uh, uh, reassertion. So I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about that notion of global Asia art in relation to this then. Because while on the one hand we see Asian Australian art as a minority art practice in some ways, yet we know internationally there's great market traction and increasingly this idea of global Asia in terms of cultural production and, 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 and artworks in particular has huge market value, has huge political presence um, as well. So would you, you know, how do you negotiate these two? from a very nationalist position into the, into the, the transnational and the international. Just, just going back to your question about the, um, the way in which you know, uh, we define ourselves and, and, and the problem with, with the notion of the marginal uh, you know, artists is that it's completely institutional capital now. It's got nothing to do with, it has obviously got to do with a lot of uh, artists on existential questioning, but it's completely institutional capital. So it forecloses a lot of the, the, the issues, uh, wider issues that artists also need to question. You know? and, uh, and we're in a situation in contemporary art where uh, the merit-based idea of art criticism has been substituted by distraction, presentation, and probably, uh, I mean, a, a, a huge sense of um, 
uh, people turning turning it into uh, social capital. You know, like, it's not really got anything to do with merit or, or any philosophical questioning. So, so, so this this problem is 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 um, you know uh, worldwide. It's worldwide. And uh, but but just also answering your question, trying to answer your question about the regional thing. Um, you know, there's also a pr problem that we feel we belong to Asia, but Asia doesn't actually feel that we belong to them, you know? Like, I mean, I've had shows in China where people see me as totally Australian, and immediately I'm othered. You know, I can't even say that I'm a Chinese diaspora. It doesn't make any difference. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, we're all very positive about the whole regional thing, but it's not necessarily the case when you come to, you know... Do we all say something? Or? Oh, if no. you, only if you feel like it. Oh. I'm stuck in diaspora. God, maybe I need to move on. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, my you? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this might be a good time to um, open it up for um, discussions and, and comments from the floor as well. Could I ask you, before you ask your question, to identify yourself just so that um, the panel um, knows you? Yes, please. The microphone? Oh. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Cathy Munro, um, Associate of China Studies Centre. Um, given that we're talking about 20-year foray, contemporary arts, um, just from your perspective, how has the um, artistic impressions changed over time of its impression of the multiculturalism in the society? And uh, next part, it's um, given the given that you're how how do you ensure or in the future how do, how do you ensure the that there there is a long vision approach the long vision approach to arts and also the um, uh, ma maintaining artistic freedom amid uh, bureaucratic, uh, administrative, and, and political constraint. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Cathy. Um, I'll answer the first part of your question. I, th I've, um, I mean, because I was so influenced by um, um, what I saw is, you know, some of the my, my senior artists that went before me, like John, like Lindy, all of the artists associated with Foray when I was um, in my formative years as an art student, as a young person. Um, I've been really keenly observing as I grew up, the generation below me, to see um, what people are feeling and making and doing now. And my sense, having, um, you know, met and worked with some younger artists these days, people of colour, um, young people are really much more savvy than I was when I was younger, um, and they have greater tools in terms of language, devices they can use to um, uh, like change the conversation or question things that are directed at them. Um, yeah, it's, much more, it's a much more nuanced and complex conversation now that younger artists are um, engaging in, um, or even just on the street when, you know, the, the population is so diverse now that um, young people have, are having really different conversations. And I think that flows on into the art that's being made and, and the way it's being made. That's my response. Um, I, th I think like this is potentially the last generation of artists that is going to be able to rely on um, just having a nationalist identity, like an Australian identity. Like, um, by that I mean, um, again, maybe a little bit critical here, but like the idea of like uh, the modernist idea of the Australian male painter who has what sells paintings for sixty thousand dollars in Australia, but it's not worth anything anywhere else. Like, I think that is like on the way out, and I think that artists are now going to have to participate in a more global conversation. And I, I think that we're all fortunate enough to have those links to to our sort of global neighbours and have these these different conversations. Uh, and I, yeah, I totally agree. I think people are getting more and more savvy. Um, and one more thing, this is maybe on a market side of things, like growing up in Perth, like we don't have a, com like we don't really have a commercial market in Perth for art. And because, because if a collector in Perth, this is me, my opinion, so it's not based on any scientific facts, but, so, but uh, from what I've seen is that if people have uh, the budget to buy work at a certain price point, 
they're going to come to Sydney or Melbourne to buy it. Like they're not going to buy locally. And in Sydney or Melbourne, if they've got the budget now, I think we're moving towards, if they've got the budget to spend $60,000 or $70,000 on a work, they, they can buy an artist from anywhere in the world. So they can go to, they go to like Basel in Hong Kong, they can go anywhere and they can get whatever they want. Um, and I think that is how it's going to shift in that we're going to sort of, people will start looking for things outside of the country, if that makes sense. I, th I think that, you know, talking about buying and selling really, uh, it's a very interesting point because I, I think that um, that in itself has also changed. I mean, you know, in the past people buy artworks uh, based on certain merits and certain sort of uh, uh, degree of uh, lineage in terms of the, the way how artists actually uh, have a dialogue with, with their past and so on and so forth. But now it is flattened to one level. Uh, you know, the way how people buy, they buy off Instagram. You know, like it is just social capital. There's nothing else to it than just social capital that they, they're buying some works for. Not all, everybody, but I think generally speaking, the market has really changed. And in a way, it might serve you guys. <laughs> uh, and I disagree with you. I think the white male artists, young, young white male artists selling at $60,000 will probably be the only person left in the market. <laughs> uh, because they're always the last man standing, you know? Like, uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's one thing that I've really had to face that this, this ceiling, this financial ceiling as, as well as this symbolic ceiling, uh, when you get to the museological levels, uh, the level of acknowledgement. Yeah. So while we're on the subject of white male artists, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, uh, 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 racialization of the artists. I'm interested in the gendering of the artists too. So, you know, what's, is there a power differential between female Asian Australian artists, where are they? Uh, we've got Lindy, Mayu, um, um, you know, is there an issue um, between, is there a gendering differential in, in, in our little pocket of the world? Um, I guess I'll have to ask you to answer, but I'd be really interested in the art, other artists, female artists in the room, uh, for their comments as well. Well, I'm working on a project to do with the butterfly, I suppose, and that has to come into the picture. I guess Madame Butterfly, I'm sick and tired of the Madame Butterfly story. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at that at the moment. And yes, it makes a difference that I am actually female um, and Japanese that is doing a project about butterflies. If I was male, that would be different, I would think. But, you know, um, it's actually easier because I'm middle-aged. <laughs> I think there's definitely a gender disparity. I'm, I'm hoping and I'm optimistic that it's improving. Any, any views from the floor or John? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. You know, with Asian Australian artists, the genderization is very, very clear. I mean, I, I give one example, which is the, uh, uh, the Beijing artists who came to Australia in... Uh, 89, uh, there was groups of uh, different gender artists and, and yet the, the ones that were actually promoted were actually the archetypal male artist and uh, the female artists, including one of our directors at 4A, Wang Fu Bing Hui, mm -hmm. needed to become a curator instead because she felt that she was not being acknowledged as a Chinese uh, women artist. I'm looking for Lindy. I'd love to hear her views. Is she in the room? <laughs> Could I ask, well, Annette, I'll put you in the oh, say, Oh, first one. yes, please do. I'm Pap the one's one good. Uh, I moved here to Sydney in 1996, the year for a founded. Um, and I have been on and off uh, and uh, participating with 4A mainly, um, not in the mainstream. Um, I am very interested with John Young's notion of, you know, uh, losing identity. Um, but I'm not going to t talk about that, uh, but share my experience because recently uh, I uh, have been approached from 
an American um, collector in the U.S. and uh, saying that um, that 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 from New York, <coughs> sorry, New York, and say that um, would you be interested to host a studio visit um, in Bangkok? And I said I moved that I, I moved from there 20 years earlier. Um, so it's <laughs> how we can how can we taking the box out of this female Asian artists, but art, what we do, or what the, sub, uh, the subject or the interest that we are working on. That's my experience. Yeah, that's Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> Congratulations. Do you want to comment? Thank you. I think I've got a question. Oh, I'm going to get in first. <laughs> I'll stand up. Um, yeah, my name is Pedro de Almeida. I'm 4A's program manager. Um, I have a question for John, who's, of course, 4A's board member, but I assure you this is not a Dorothy Dixer, right? He doesn't know this question is coming. <laughs> Um, the reality is John lives in Melbourne, so I see him half a dozen times a year, so I've had to wait for a symposium to ask him a question. <laughs> um, you mentioned the importance of critical writing and so forth, and you know, I knew you, well I worked at 4A's for a few years until I remembered that you published early pieces in Art and Text, seminal um, postmodernism magazine uh, based in Melbourne um, from the 1980s, um, and also lots of other platforms. And today you mentioned that kind of period in your life when you sort of, I guess, started to engage with yourself as an Asian Australian artist and you lost a lot of friends. I should know my art and text sort of back catalogue more than I should, but you were probably one of the only, probably one of the few Asian Australian writers for that text, were you? And maybe if you can talk about that period and that sort of writing around postmodernism at the time in, in Melbourne. Yeah, I, I really was trying to um, diffuse the situation through, in those days, uh, the solution of subjectivity, you know, in an artist. And I thought that if, if one gets rid of that, you, you might be able to look further afield rather than just, you know, sort of this sort of very... Um, what am I talking about? Basically, I'm trying to say that... Uh, Probably yes, I, I was the probably the only Asian uh, writing at that point. Uh, but also Lindy uh, was also editing together with Mark Titmarsh on the beach, which was also a, a, a postmodern, two very important postmodern sort of journals at that point. So I think that um, it's it's rather ironic that in those days uh, postmodernism seems to be as fanciful enthusiastic paradigm that we are all ushering in, but now that we're living in the postmodern condition, it's not so much fun anymore, you know? <laughs> uh, so it, uh, in a sense, uh, I think it was important to have that insight, but also that we've sort of moved on. But, but, uh, but these things are all rhetorical in a sense that, you know, like, there are times that we need to insist on identity and other times not. And so, so I, I really feel that... Um, it's very problematized at the moment, this, this issue of identity. Sorry, did I answer your question at all? <laughs> yeah. Just very, very briefly about the previous question. You can't separate gender from class and wealth. I've interviewed 20 plus in, uh, artists in Asia over 10 years of women, women artists. All of them come from the upper middle classes or the upper classes. There's definitely um, to do with their financial background 
enables them to become artists of note. Um, I'd just like to pick up on a point as well. Um, we talked about the glass ceiling before, and I think it's really important um, to recognise those issues for um, female Asian Australian artists. But there's also been a lot of talk recently in business worlds about the bamboo ceiling, uh, especially through the work of Tim Sud Pomasan at the, the Human Rights Commission. It would be really interesting, I mean, maybe this is also answering the end of your question, Cathy, about what can 4 do in the future, about maybe how we could um, address things like the bamboo ceiling and things that might be in, getting in the way of um, Asian Australians taking up positions of decision-making positions um, to, to sort of change things at an institutional level. Um, that's just a thought that occurred. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have one thing to add in. Um, I um, have no commercial gallery in Sydney, uh, where I have been living for 20 years. Um, uh, one experience that I had from commercial galleries um, after having seen, having looked at my work and the whole portfolio that I presented, um, and um, after overnight, and um, I the portfolio came back to me and saying that, Patawan, you are too difficult to work with. I can't work with you. It's, uh, it's uh, the amount of the work and at, uh, it's the um, no visibility of my presence here that I think I struggle with. Yeah, I, th I think that you know, cultural gatekeeping is such an important issue. You know, like particularly when you become a more uh, mature, you know, mid, mid uh, career artist, uh, it, it, you certainly see that ceiling uh, that there are people out there that are actually, you know, not explicitly, but there's a certain sort of agreement that, you know, you're sort of stopped at a certain level. And, uh, and I, I really feel that uh, this is why I really feel that it's important. For, um, for the Asian Australian artist context to develop criticality, which is another position uh, uh, to to increase the sort of like level of discussion and merit within the work, so that there, there's no argument that these works are actually of worth, you know. But it's equally important to have in place, just as there is in the corporate world, um, you know, in terms of addressing the bamboo ceiling, of not just people needing to work on their own, but how do we work collectively, like you said, in terms of looking at developing critical capacity, but equally about mentorship, championship, you know, what strategies is the Asian and Australian advocacy. art community yeah. advocacy yeah. doing? Is it still relying on the same institutions, the few little organizations that have been bubbling yeah. along? Um, and how well do we really support our own organizations in order for them to thrive, in order to do the work for I us? I mean, I, I give you a very good example of uh, the, the lack of advocacy roles. For example, uh, there was a very large exhibition in Melbourne called Melbourne Now last year. Out of 387 artists and designers that were included, there were three Asian visual art artists and 10 designers, so 13. Now, if you work in terms of, in a crassest way, in just in terms of uh, a percentage of proportioning of Asians living in Melbourne, there should have been 70 Asian artists involved. And, you know, quite often you don't want to get to this level of... Uh, drudgery, you know, to start talking about numbers, but it's, it's a very blaring situation here where, you know, people are literally quite angry that, uh, you know, the representation's not there. I, I wanted to add to, oh, one, one more thing to that to sort of contribute to that uh, with the, something that's happening now. Say, for example, this is me probably putting my foot in my mouth again, but this, like, say, Primavera that's on at the moment uh, at the MCA, it's a, uh, it's, it's a show of all white artists, and it's, a, it's an interesting show, and there's a lot of interesting artists, but one of the questions that was put to the curator at the, the, the press event was why there weren't any Aboriginal artists in the show, and, and they said uh, that they looked, but they just couldn't find any. Now, for, for, so, there, so, 
so, but for their curatorial vision or whatever. But like that's the type, that's what you're up against where they're like, oh, you know, we tried, but like, so it's, very, it's super frustrating. I think, I mean, for us, I mean, I've got a few things to add to this conversation is that when I started in this role at 4A, um, things got even more complicated in the fact that we're part of a conglomerate in Sydney of major cultural institutions, so across libraries, archives, museums. There's 63 organisations we meet monthly. I am the only person who is not white in the whole room. And then in that situation, not only do I speak for 4A and sort of Asian-Australian connections, I speak for every other and then when there's a question that comes up, everyone defers to me. Oh, Michaela will answer that one. Um, so I think the idea of when you embrace or you think about your identity, and especially in the sort of the area that we work, um, it gets really complicated because we can't... I can only speak for me. I can speak for what projects we're doing and the research we've done, but I can't speak for everything. You know, Pedro's biggest pet hate is everyone going, Pedro de Almeida, that's not Asian. So, you know, why... <laughs> why so... <laughs> The conversation is, is really complex. Why cannot a Portuguese migrant be involved in Asian art? Of course, this is what being part of Australian culture is. There is it all, everything is blurred, and I think that kind of celebration is what 4A is about. And John has been doing a great spruiking this entire panel that was not planned about critical writing. But about, about one hour ago, we actually flipped the switch on our new website, and our new um, biannual um, journal, online journal, just went live. And Pedro is being the managing editor, and it is really um, born of something that we've had discussions since I arrived. I had a, a few things happen when I arrived at 4A that I left the academic world for the first time since birth, and I lost my um, I lost my JSTOR access, which is the what you get all the articles. So suddenly, my way to research what I was interested in suddenly I couldn't get things, and there is a massive barrier for the everyday person to read things if they cannot access these journals, if things are behind a paywall, if these discussions are part of some magazine online you have to pay for. So the 4A Papers is about critical writing, it's about talking about this, the, all these different perspectives and it's free and we're supporting all sorts of people who are writing. And the first edition goes from sort of Alana Hunt's hard hitting, Pedro and I discussing about mm, are we going to have any questions that come up when we apply for future funding about this, but we'll do it anyway. Um, to really sort of playful articles. And I think this is a really important part of 4A. Many of the discussions or debates that we have in the office about exhibitions don't ever turn up in the space, but they were critical in what happened getting us there. And we're hoping that will be a bit more visible. Um, but thank you very much. It was really interesting. And I think, I, I think it really underlines the fact that there is no singular Asian Australian. It is a really complex, shifting beast. So thank you for being so great.